Hello and welcome to a very special episode of Farmland here at the FTMTA Farm Machinery Show at Punchestown Racecourse. Thousands of people have availed of the lovely weather over the past few days to get up close and personal with the latest innovations and developments in the farm machinery sector. Later in the programme, I'll be joined by Liam Haid from New Holland, one of the most popular manufacturers in Ireland. But first, I'm joined by President of the FTMTA, Jeremy Claridge. Jeremy Claridge, thank you for joining us on Farmland. It's great to be back here in Punchestown today, an actual in-person event after a hiatus of two years. How does it feel to actually be able to get out and about and meet people again? It's, it's great, Stella. Um, farm machinery industry is built upon people-to-people -people contact and that face-to-face -face experience. That's what sales is all about. So to be able to come here today after being locked down effectively for the last number of years with these events, it's great. It really is great. And these kind of events take a lot of organisation. It's not something that you started planning last week. No, no it's huge. It, to plan any show, the work that goes on in the background months before the event ever takes place is massive. And it's, it's everything from be it crowd control, health and safety, get machines in, get them offloaded, loaded. And then, of course, there's a work afterwards, get the machines out again. So it's a big effort. And I have to say a huge credit to the FTMDA team, uh, head, up, head up by Michael, Michael Farley and... Uh, the subcommittee of, of the show of sorry the show subcommittee of the FTMTA the work that they have put together and put in to uh, pull off today and yesterday's event credit to them all. And I suppose Jeremy though over the last two years everyone has experienced challenges within their own industry or their own sector but especially so when people can't get out to view machinery or to see machinery so how has the industry coped over the last two years? I suppose technology is still a really came to the forefront the last number of years in terms of being able to launch certain products or show products uh, virtually via like some Microsoft Teams or via the internet but that's it's only a, it, it's it's a consolation to the problems of COVID and it's it's one way of doing it, but it's not the best way the best way to do it is in person like we have here today because it's only when you get up front beside the machine that you can really get a feel for what it's all about and it's, I suppose, it's a psychological part of, of buying and selling. Um, like when you go in to buy a new car, you want to sit into it, you want to touch the steering wheel, you want to turn the wing mirror or whatever. And it's the same with farm machinery. You want to come up, sit in the tractor, work the machine, visualize yourself with it. And uh, it gives you a greater idea of what you're purchasing and what you want. So to have a show like this is what it's all about. And it gets us back into that uh, person to person type contact again. And did you find then over the last two years from members in the FTMTA who you would have been speaking to that there was a challenge there in trying to get customers or to get people when they couldn't physically see something in person or I suppose because the economy was so uncertain for such a long time as well that maybe people were holding on to their spends? Yeah, there was, and there was that, there's always that, um, that concern there that people do hold back. And like I say, you can only really... Um, get some part of the feel of the machine online but it's that person to person contact and that sometimes eliminates the fear or the concern that people have about holding onto money or not spending and um, so go again going back to that face to face type scenario which shows you can talk to people and people can find out straight up live what the machine is about what it can do for their business so it's been a great asset and Jeremy now at the moment we're in a cost of living crisis, I suppose, not just in Ireland, but really across the world. The war in Ukraine hasn't helped. We are now experiencing post-Brexit challenges. What are the current challenges facing farm machinery manufacturers, um, trades, sellers? I suppose the big, from a manufacturing point of view, the big challenges at the moment are components. And we, everyone is talking about the component crisis. Um, and it's a big thing. I mean, we all thought Brexit was going to be difficult, but little did we know that the, the onset of COVID and uh, subsequently the Ukraine war, unfortunately, what effect that would have. And it's, it's a serious, serious effect. But I think credit has to go out to the manufacturers and suppliers on how they are trying to cope with that. And uh, the different scenarios that they're faced with, but they also the solutions that they're coming up with. And they have to be coming with them really, really fast to ensure that machines are still being produced and being delivered. So there's cases where machines were ordered and produced pre, pre the Ukraine crisis that now can't be delivered because of a transport crisis. Uh, but again, the solutions that people are finding to combat that, um, hats off to them. 
But I think um, the future in terms of component level is, is still difficult. Um, unfortunately, that's the reality. Uh, but I think there's, there's always a solution somewhere and we, we keep working together. There's other, also other um, issues like of, um, recruitment is a big, big issue globally, unfortunately, in every industry, but also at farm level and in manufacturing level and retail level. Um, and something that we promote in the FTMTA is the recruitment and retention of staff within the dealership levels. And it's a big thing, I suppose, that's close to my heart because I started off in a workshop scenario in a, in a dealership, served my time, and then pushed forward uh, to where I'm working now with Pottinger as its managing director. And I think people forget that there is alternative routes to getting into uh, senior roles in the farm machine industry that you don't have to go to university level. You can start off in a dealership, and that's something we want to promote. So the, uh, the route of in entering into your local dealership and working through. Um, so that's one of the things that, that is facing dealers at the moment, yes. And I suppose no one likes to envisage price increases, but everything is increasing at the moment. How can you convince farmers or those working in agri-contracting to make that big spend at the moment when they are facing such challenges with input costs rising, cost of living mm -hmm. rising? You know, is it more difficult to do now? I think what people have to understand, Stella, I have to, to, to break it down and look into it as to why the costs are increasing. And it's not that, definitely not because manufacturers are making more profit, not at all. So number one, research and development costs money. And with the demands today or the regulations today, whether it's climate change, whether it's, it's more food production, that costs money to invent, to research, develop and produce machinery to get into that standard. And we're also at a stage where the, the, the buyer, the contractor, the farmer, he's buying a tractor today or a machine today, he wants pretty good specs. So he wants comfortable seat, he probably wants air conditioning, he probably wants isobus. So these things that they hadn't got or didn't want 20, 30 years ago. But that technology uh, and that production costs money to do that and to offer that. So that's one part of the puzzle. Uh, but yes, machines are getting more expensive, but to, to combat the demands. We want machines now that can do more acres in a day. We also want machines that can, that can give back a lifestyle to the operator or to the driver or the owner by doing more in a day or being a more comfortable machine to operate so the operator's not going home tired and wrecked. He's got a lifestyle. So again, all these things do cost money to produce and that's just a part of it. And of course, then the other price increase is coming from the likes of the component levels, which we just spoke about, which unfortunately, is reality, um, but hopefully, fingers crossed, in time, we will get back on a better side of it. And looking forward then for dealerships, for manufacturers, how is the industry viewing things? I'm sure you've been talking to a lot of them over the past two days and, and certainly through your work as president of FTMTA. What is the outlook? The outlook is very, very good. I mean, we have to continue to produce food and the machine industry is a vital, vital part in that. Without machinery, we just would not have food. It's as simple as all that. So I think the outlook, we have to remain positive. Um, we have to feed ourselves. We have to feed the globe. And we have to always keep looking at new ways to either make more food or possibly make food production cheaper. Uh, but also we must also forget cheap food is one thing, but quality is another thing. And we must keep food quality up. So with these new inventions and these new machines, that's how we're going to do it. So the outlook is very, very good. And we must, we must remain positive. Um, any of these difficult scenarios, they only last for a short period of time. We always must think of the future and what's ahead. Of course, a lot of the members of FTMTA, of course, there are some that you know are, are dealerships that are quite large dealerships, many others that are, are family owned smaller dealerships yep. and, and, and they're relying on their local community to buy from them or, or from the region around them to buy from them. And then they also employ in that community. So it's, it's sort of cyclical in a way. Absolutely, yeah. And, and the FTMTA is here when you mention its members, the FTMTA is here to assist the members and assist the, the industry. And it's, people don't sometimes understand what the FTMTA does. And it's important to mention what it actually does. We don't just do shows. This is just a very, very small part of what we do. So, I mean, the FTMTA is a lobbying group. We're there to assist its members. We're there to, I suppose, fight sometimes government policies or other European policies, because there's always something coming at us. So I'd encourage, if you're not a member of the FTMTA, look into it. Um, we're there to help. We, we help with everything from, it could be HR matters, it could be financial matters, it could be, um, like I said, current regulation matters from Europe. We were lobbying group. Um, and the industry needs an association to represent itself. 
And if we don't support the, the association or we don't have members, we can't then lobby and we can't then be there as a support. So anybody who is not a, currently an FTMTNJ member, I'd welcome you to come in to the office, give us a phone call, ring Michael, or speak to another dealer or any one of the council members, and we'd be happy to tell you what we do. Great. German Claridge, President of FTMTA, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Stella. Thank you. Good show. Just what contractors want. Yeah, the weather's great and uh, suits a lot of people for it's in between sailage cuts where we can get out. Liam Haid, Area Sales Manager with New Holland Agriculture. Thank you for joining us on the programme today, Liam. New Holland has a big exhibit here at the FTMTA show in Punchestown. And one of the more popular machines that I've noticed amongst the visitors certainly is the methane power tractor. Tell us a bit about that or the concept behind it. Okay, so the, the idea from New Holland for a long time has been to what they call it a clean energy leader. So they've been playing with alternative fuels in an engineering capacity for quite some time. The original prototype was actually based around hydrogen. They were known as the NH2 and NH3. But in 2013, there was a move to go to a biomethane based product, which is what we see out there today. So that's been prototyped since 2013. It's essentially a standard T6180 that's been modified. So the cylinder head is now reworked. Instead of having uh, diesel injectors, we've got spark plugs and we can run off of gas as opposed to running off of diesel. So it's a, it's a very, standardized concept that we've modified to make suitable for an alternative fuel. And what has the feedback been from the visitors here to the show? Everyone's interested because it's novel looking. There's what we call the range extender on the front which gives you more capacity. Um, but it's a lot of questions are more based around the plausibility of using biomethane on a farm or access to biomethane. The product, most people come in and expect to see a blue tractor and that's exactly what they see. But they're interested in how do we store methane? Where do we get it? How do we make it? Is there any pitfalls? Can I maybe look at modifying something I have on farm to currently have methane? So there's lots of conversations based around it. And we're working quite closely with some of the guys at Gas Networks Ireland who have been on stand, have been really helpful to us. And they've answered a lot of the questions that we couldn't. Because obviously we're tractor manufacturers, that this is bigger than tractors. This is energy independence for anyone who can potentially produce their own biomethane. So it's, it's a big subject. And Liam, you mentioned there, I suppose, that it is a bit of a novelty at the moment for, for a lot of customers or potential customers. I suppose the big question that people have with something like that is, while it's a novelty now, is it something that can become practical on a farm, particularly in Ireland? Yeah, so I suppose the first thing to, to state is that tractor is now commercially available. So we can take orders, produce and deliver those machines on farm straight away. So it's no longer in concept stage. We can sell it, we, we, we can support it. The, the broader situation is infrastructure for fueling. So farm, biomethane wasn't, uh, haphazard guess. It was a targeted decision. So there is potential to produce your own biomethane on farm. There are two types. One is the kind of manufactured process that will be anaerobic digesters. It's technology that's been throughout Europe, specifically in Germany for quite some time. But we're also looking at the opportunity to capture fugitive methane. So the buzzword unfortunately around agriculture and climate recently has been that methane's this problem and cows are the problem. You know, farming is not the solution. But think about a world where your cows at home, you can capture the gas off of their slurry and you can save that slurry, compress it down, clean it and use it to fuel your tractor. You're stopping that fugitive methane escaping into the atmosphere, which is harmful, but you're also reducing your, your reliance on fossil fuels. You're not burning fossil fuels that have got your, your NOx, 
your other bits of particulate matter that we're trying to reduce of emissions control. So it's really beneficial in both ways. Infrastructure is definitely something that needs to be worked on. But I'm, again, talking to gas networks, there is a very large amount of digesters currently in the planning phase in Ireland. So I think very quickly we're going to find ourselves in a position to fuel this tractor in most places. Talking about New Holland in general then, in terms of environmental standards, sustainability is a buzzword for every area of the economy now, but also among manufacturers of, of farm machinery. I mean, there's regulations in relation to stage five emissions and so on. How has New Holland adapted? It seems that you nearly were ahead of the curve a little bit in terms of identifying that need for more sustainable ways of developing machinery. Yeah, so like I said, it, it's been something that's clearly been in the parent group's mindset. You see, CNH Industrial is the parent group, and of course the spin-off to that is Iveco. So Iveco are our sister brand who are working on trucks, yep. pickups, stuff like that. There are 110 gas-powered Iveco trucks working in Ireland today. So we're, the parent group has seen this opportunity a long time ago. There is a broader picture of sustainability as well. I mean, I remember when I first joined the company, they took great pride in telling us that the combine panels that you see over here, they're actually made using soya hull extract. So it was a case of it doesn't all have to be plastics, and we're supporting our customers by doing that. We're buying their product. Um, we talked about the prototyping, the hydrogen. It is something that is very much in the forefront of our organisation broadly, is to be more sustainable. and. What's more important is offer our dealers and our customers the opportunity to be part of that sustainable future as well. It's fantastic for us to be able to say we're sustainable, but our partners, our customers, our dealers, they all need to be sustainable as well. And if we can't pass that technology and that opportunity on, it's not really achieving the broader picture of what we want or where we want to be. Liam, can you tell me about the challenges a company such as New Holland Agriculture is facing at the moment? We've come off the back of two years with not a lot of in-person trade shows as a result of a global pandemic. We have Brexit, we have uh, war in Ukraine, which are obviously impacting on every aspect of the economy. But what challenges is the likes of New Holland experiencing? I think the challenges across the trade are everyone seeing something similar but based on where they source their components or how they produce their product, the, the, the effects are different. I mean, the biggest issue for us, COVID firstly, was not being in front of customers. Mm -hmm. Selling tractors, being involved in someone's purchase decision on a, a significant purchase on a farm, it's not something that's done flippantly. It's very often a, firstly, you qualify what the customer wants, you sit, you talk to them, and it can be as simple as I have a shed that's eight foot high. I, I, you know, the door entrance, I can't look at a tractor that's any less and he wants someone to come in and look and say, this is what I can do. I can remove cab suspension, I can fit you 34 inch wheels, I can bring the overall height down and you offer him a solution. It was very hard to do that during COVID. Moving on from there then, even with our dealers, we are constantly learning from each other. We're talking about the trade, we're understanding where the industry is, we're feeding back different things about products, things we can do differently. And without meeting your dealers, it's very hard to do that as well. And I think the thing that no one really discussed, discusses now because we're past it, but I think the mental health of everyone in the trade, agriculture is a very sociable trade. You see the show today, there's a lot of people here. People like to talk, people like to share ideas. And for the best part of two years, people couldn't do that. So there was a lot of difficulties within it. We moved past COVID now, in our practical day to day, and I think we're starting to see the ripple after it. Componentry is becoming very difficult to locate. Um, very simple components are bought on such a grand scale that some of our suppliers aren't able to supply. Then the logistics that go with it, the moving of these components, it's very easy to lock someone into a 10 year contract at a fixed price for a switch, but the truck that brings that switch from where it's manufactured in a, in a different country to our, our manufacturing sites is now costing 40, 50, 60% more because of the price of diesel. So everything at the moment is so fluid that we're finding it very hard to commit to people. And with this trade, if you can't commit, you don't have something that a customer wants. He wants people to come to you and say, I'm gonna get this product at this price and it's gonna do this job. It's very hard to do that at the moment. We're really having to manage all of those things at one time. We have to set the customer's expectations on delivery. We have to work with our factory and they have to try and fulfill orders in the timeliest manner we can and then talk with our suppliers to see that we can get components to complete the loop. So it is at the moment being very difficult forgetting what's going on in farming. Price of fertilizer, price of diesel. You know, it's, it's a difficult, difficult time, but I think difficult times like this make or break relationships and organizations. You said there the certainty that farmers in particular look for when 
they're going to buy machinery. It is true, farming is a calendar industry and farmers know what they're going to be doing at various times of the year. They know when they'll have cash flow to buy machinery. And I'm hearing today even a lot of people saying that they're ordering machines and they could be waiting a year, 13 months to get one. How are you trying to work with farmers who are considering a big purchase such as that, but then get told, well, we may not have this until 2023, late 2023? We have to set expectations from the word go. Now, we're, we're in a fortunate position that we have a good organisation behind us in manufacturing and forecasting. So we do have some product available between now and Christmas. A lot of manufacturers, un unfortunately, are not in that same scenario. But you set the expectations from the word go. When the customer comes to you and says, this is what I'm thinking about, if you cannot satisfy that straight away, be upfront. I'm happy to talk to you, but we might be talking about a Q2 delivery for 2023. However, if you can manage with something different, I have these available in Q4 of 2022. So it becomes a conversation. It goes back to what I said, you become more of a partner in that you exchange information rather than under promising or over promising, sorry, and under delivering. That's a very risky position to find yourself in. So it, it is difficult. Farmers though are very pragmatic people. They understand. They're involved in lots of different facets. You know, every farmer in the country sells and buys on a regular basis. He understands things are not as easy to get. Things have gone up in price. There are changes to the market. So if you have that conversation with them and you're very clear on what your position is, they're very clear on theirs. We can hopefully find a place in the middle. Dealers have been fantastic. I've got a great bunch of dealers in Ireland and they will always put their customer first. I hear of times where some of my dealers have actually bought secondhand tractors in to keep customers going until their new one arrives can think of a couple of instances where units were due to be built in two months, it pushed to four months, and they were given something to keep them going. So we're all trying our best. And the customers are appreciating that as well, which is greatly appreciated. And I suppose the advice to farmer customers today as well is that maybe a purchase that they would have made in the past is not going to be as simple as that and that they need to think further ahead than they probably normally would have in the past. I think that's the best advice I could give anyone I've spoke to in the last couple of days. Previously, there would be a, a, a calendar, as you would say, that around October, end of September, people would start shopping for tractors. And there would always be that 12 to 14 week production cycle, which we were all in. Generally, if we had an order by the end of September, we could deliver it by the end of December and we'd be able to invoice for tax year. It would be fantastic. But now that isn't feasible. So like you say, if you're interested in something now, put your hand up, talk to us. We can maybe find something to suit you. We can always spec change it if it's due to be produced and plan a little further ahead and we can all get to a point where we can deliver something that's acceptable to you in a time manner that's expect acceptable to you. Liam, looking ahead, do you think that these issues will resolve in the short to medium term? I, I believe they will. Um, I think short term, it depends on how short your short term is. Personally, I think it'll be more of a medium term thing. I think, I think there's, a, there's a backlog now. You know, everybody is buying their components in similar type places. All of these manufacturers now have orders probably to keep them satisfied for the next 12 to 18 months. It depends again on how your logistics and your manufacturing is handled. Um, every company is different and every company will buy in different manners. And economies of scale will come to play. If someone's buying a few controllers from a manufacturer and another company's buying 10,000 controllers, it's not fair, but the guy buying 10,000 controllers is going to get seen to first because he's a more you know, a larger customer. It's the reality of economics. So it will take a while to wash down, but things will improve. Will we get back to 12 to 14 week production? I'm not sure it'll be that fast, but we could very quickly see ourselves back at sort of a five to seven month production cycle, which I think is a fair compromise. And finally, looking ahead for the outlook, New Holland is one of the most popular brands amongst the, the farming community here in Ireland. What sort of outlook has the company itself? So going forward, we, we're heavily invested in um, developing what we currently offer. So we've made some acquisitions in the last few years, going back as far as sort of four to five years now, we invested in the Kongskildi Group, brought them in and we brought in implements into the, into the New Holland offering. Recently, we invested in a company called Raven, which is an American company based wholly on um, precision farming techniques, everything from precision seed planting, um, right the way through to data management and screens. And the company is very focused on broadening its offering, broadening its offering to customers so that we can be a solution for whatever they may need. Farming is gonna change, and the company is very aware of that. They're very aware that the world is not the same today than it was 12 months ago, and it won't be the same in 12 months either. So the outlook is to continually improve ourselves, continually invest and continue to listen to what our customers want and hope to grow with them. Liam, thank you very much for joining us on Farmland today. Perfect, thank you. 
That's all from this episode of Farmland from the FTMTA Farm Machinery Show here at Punchestown Racecourse. You can stay up to date with all the latest agricultural news on agriland.ie or follow us on social media at the following links. Mm -hmm.